Thank you. Father, we just come before you tonight, my God. We are truly, truly, truly grateful. Grateful, O oh God, for all that you do, all that you have done, and all that you continue to do. Spirit of the living God, we just come before you tonight. God, and we quiet our minds and our hearts. God, we want to continue the conversation that you have started with us. In that, my God, the question I've been posed and proposed, how do we hear God? How do we hear God? And it's a great question, Lord, because it's one that have been pondered throughout the years. And what's best place to come than in a study where your spirit reside and rests. And we come and we inquire of the Lord as they did in olden days. We make sure that our minds and our hearts are at the place where we connect with heaven. And when we do, God and you begin to speak. There's a free flow in that, oh God, you begin to commune with us as you did in olden days. So it is my prayer, O oh God, tonight, my God, that as we come and as we gather into your presence, my God, you will allow teaching tonight to be easy. God, I pray that you will provoke, my God, the hearts and the minds of your sons and your daughters to be inquisitive and to make this a dialogue and not a monologue. Dialogue in the sense that we ask questions that is on our heart, because how do we get clarity and context to anything, oh God, that is on our heart, we have to ask. And so anything that is missing, my God, context can be offered so we can walk away understanding that, yes, that makes sense or that does not make sense. God, your word is the final authority. So we gather in your presence and whatever it is your word say, we have to make room in our hearts, my God, so that your word, my God, can have its rightful place. David said to us, thy word, have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee? So ultimately, God, we're not just here to read your word, but we're here to make room in our lives and in our hearts so your word could have its rightful place. Why? Because when I have to deliberate over matters, my God, that are before me, your word as a seat at the table of my heart, and when I begin to go around the table and I get to your word, your word get to say yea or nay. And so, God, it is, my God, in this mindset that we know come. And we're asking you tonight, Lord God, to have your way. Have your way, my God, for the time that you have allotted. My God, I pray that your sons and your daughters will be edified, not by me, but through your word. We look to you tonight and we say thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Good night, good night, good night. I'm happy and excited. My God, I couldn't wait to get here. And I know you are feeling the same way. And so I want to... Before we continue, I just want to ask, are there anything that we have discussed so far about here in God, any part of it that, you know, it's not clear to you, anything that we talked about, uh, you're saying, well, Pastor, you know, you said this and I didn't quite understand it. So can you go ahead and just share a little bit more? Because again, like I said, I don't want for this to be something where I just sit here and just teach. That is something I can do. But in order for me to teach and to tailor uh, what he has given to me to give you, you have to let me know where you are. So we make it a dialogue and not a monologue. Any questions so far? That was not clear. Anything about what we said last week? When you sat and you thought about it, you're like, well, you know, this is not quite that clear. So can we revisit that again? I'm not going to say it. It's not clear. I'm just waiting to get to the point where mm -hmm. um, it becomes more clearer for me to okay. hear his word. And I know in order for me to hear it clearly, I have to get into it. That's so right. just just reading, reading the Bible and interpreting it and making sure that I understand what it says so that I can hear what he is saying. OK. And that is that is right. So you're spot on. Initially, it can seem a bit overwhelming. But again, let's take a step back and look at how we hear naturally. Right. We have our ears that are here and our ears. Again, it consists of three parts. You have the outer, you have the inner and you have the middle ear. Right. So when I do that and the sound travel, the sound follow the curvature of your ear, it goes into the middle ear, 
the inner ear, right? The middle ear. And the middle ear again, which is the uh, eardrum, at the end of it, it kind of looks like a tube. At the end of it, you have these three tiny bones that are connected with it. And then based on the picture or the tone of what that sound is, the um, three tiny bones, they vibrate. Those bones are then connected to the inner ear and this piece, which is called the cochlea. And in the cochlea, it has this body of fluid. And then on the outer part of the cochlea, the external part, you have what looks like these ear follicles, right? And then based on the picture or the tone, my God, that we hear, the the the, the length of the um the ear follicle on the cochlea will vibrate based on the pitch. So if it's a low tone, you may find that the higher ones may vibrate if it's a high pitch. And so once the vibration begins to take place, a chemical signal is then sent to our brain to say that is that particular sound and we form association. So we come into this world as a blank slate, right? And we come into this world as a blank slate. We have no idea what's what. So when we begin to hear things, our mothers, our fathers, our customs, our culture begin to inform us that, yes, that's the noise of a dog. That's the sound of a cat. That's a car. That's a truck. And so we begin to form association based on the sounds that we hear. And so as we go, we hear different things and we don't know what it is. So we inquire somebody around us, then say to us, that's that. And so, you know, so the next time you hear that particular thing, nobody has to really tell you that's that's the sound of a door. Why? Because you had clarity of context when you were in that state of, of confusion, wondering what this is. Somebody offer clarity and context. As it relates to hearing God, the Bible contains the mind of God. So everything that God has to say to us, it is in his word. So if you're a Christian and you never read it, it is going to be difficult and hard for you to form any association. Why? Because we're going to hear things in this world. And the things that we hear in this world, we have to do what is called a comparative analysis. So you take two things that you hear, and there has to be a source where which and whereby you compare it to say if it's authentic, if it's genuine, or it's not. So where you are at this point in your walk and your relationship, it is going to take time. It is going to take time for you to begin to read the word. And when you begin to read the word, you will begin to hear the word. You will begin to question. You become inquisitive. You pause. You're not just reading it to get from Genesis to Revelation in a year. You're spending time with it. You will read one thing in the word and it will cause you to pause. It will cause you to think. It will cause you to meditate. It will cause you to begin to ask questions. So we become inquisitive when we begin to read the word. When God begin to speak to us, he not only speak through his word, but he speak to us through our five senses. So there are things that we're going to see and we're going to say that looks like God. There are things that we smell, taste, touch, hear, and feel. And we're going to say, hmm, have you ever been in a service where the presence of the Lord just descend in that service? And my God, you just sat there and you said there was something different about this because we have within us the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside. So he is what I would call the authenticator. So whatever you see that is on display, God's Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you and me, it's going to authenticate if that is of God or it's not. So every believer, every person who becomes a child of God, when we get saved, God's Holy Spirit now comes and lives on the inside. And he is our built-in GPS to guide and to confirm if what we see and what we're hearing is of God. So there is no way I can say that I'm a child of God and the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and not be aware that the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. I don't want to digress, but this scripture is coming to my mind. Paul went and visited a church and he asked them the question, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? 
And the church then said, we have not so much heard if there is a Holy Spirit. So my question is, if it's not God's Spirit that is leading and guiding and setting things in motion, precepts and precedents in, 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 in motion for the church to follow, my question then is who, what, when, or what? Because again, God's Spirit lives on the inside of you and I, and he begins to communicate. So when we spend time reading the word of God, we are going to begin to hear, know, and understand. God's voice will become familiar. I explained to you that for me, it's an audible voice that I hear. So we're going to go through a series of different ways in which God communicates. So far, we're talking about the audible voice of God. Last week, we look at the story with um, we went to 1 Samuel chapter number 3, and tonight we're going to continue with 1 Samuel chapter number 3, and we're going to go to Judges chapter number 6. 1 Samuel chapter number 3 is the story of this young boy who heard this voice. His name was Samuel, heard this voice speaking to him in the middle of the night. He got up and he went to his mentor, which is Eli, and he said, have you called me? And Eli said, no, leave me alone, go to bed. Why did you eat so late? And the boy again heard the voice speaking to him, got up, and he went to Eli a second time. And Eli's like, if you don't go to sleep, you're going to get a whooping. But the third time the voice spoke to this young man, and when the voice spoke to this young man, he went to Eli again the third time. And the Bible said that Eli perceived that it was the Lord that was speaking to him. And he said to this young boy, the next time you heard that voice, say, speak, Lord, thy servant, hear it. So God in, not only back in the Bible days, spoke to man audibly, he still do. The scripture that this teaching is built on is Hebrews chapter number one, in one God at sundry times and diverse manner spoke. So for you, if you're oriented to think that God only speak this particular way, this teaching is to help you and to broaden your understanding to be able to, uh, I don't want to say recognize, but for God's Holy Spirit on the inside of you to confirm that, yes, that is of me. And the question is, when that confirmation comes, the question is, what do you do? What do you do when you have been conditioned to think that it is only this and this alone, but God's spirit revealed to you that, yes, that is of me. Do you make room in your life to grow outside of the controlled environment that you're living in, or do you regress back into it, knowing that God's spirit spoke to you and confirmed that, yes, that is me? So God, at sundry times and diverse manner, spoke. How do we hear God? through reading his word. How do we hear God? In times of prayer. How do we hear God? We have to spend time, my God, in his word. There is no exception to it. Because again, when you read his word, you're going to hear his voice. Again, remember when we started, I said, take for example, if I were to um, go in a cabin somewhere here in North Carolina, Maya Angelou lived here and say there were some writings that she had and she didn't get to publish them, but it's in a box in an attic somewhere. And I go to that cabin and I find it and I begin to read it. There are certain expressions in which she would express herself. There are certain, when you begin to read it, you begin to hear her voice. If there is a particular author that you follow and you begin to read all of their writings, you will become familiar with the tone and inflection if of their voice in how they express themselves. And it is no different from you and I taking the time and spending time and reading his word. Does that make sense, Kenya? Perfect sense. All right. So that's how we know we have to spend time in the word. And when we hear different forms of expression that comes to us, we need to have a point of reference to validate or to vet what we're hearing. 
but we're talking tonight just about the audible voice. So I want to just, I don't want to rush and just expand it all the way out. I want to take my time and I want us to be inquisitive and to ask questions because the questions that you ask will help me as I continue in the study. I don't want to just come and teach and everybody sit back and there is something that you're pondering or considering and you never ask it and you never get clarity and context around it and the teaching is over or we move to other idioms of thoughts and expression in the teaching and you're saying to yourself, but I didn't quite get this. I want, it's okay to interrupt me. I want to make that clear. Amen? All right. So again, mm -hmm. we looked at um, the story again in First Samuel chapter number three. I'll read that and then we're going to skip over to Judges chapter number six. And it says again here that, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There were no open vision. And it came to pass that when Eli was laid down in the place, his eyes began to wax dim, and he could not see. And her, the lamp of and her, the lamp of God, went out in the temple. My God, what a state and a condition. We'll talk about that just for a brief moment, because Eli uh, was the priest at the time. He had two sons, Hophni and Phineas, who was not living right and doing right by God. And so it was challenging now for him to really and truly hear God. So that's what that is talking about, where it says, the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, and the ark of God was, and Samuel, my God, was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here I am. And he ran unto Eli and said unto him, here I am, call this thou me. And he said unto him, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down, and the Lord called yet again. And Samuel, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for thou didst call me. So he is hearing this audible voice. And he thinks that it is Eli. Eli, again, was a priest. So maybe there was some familiarity in the tone and the inflection of the voice of the Lord speaking to him. And so he associated with Eli. And he ran to Eli and said, did you call me? And he said, no, my son. So this is the second time around. And the Lord called yet again. And Samuel, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said unto him, Here I am, for thou didst call me. And he answered, and, and he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. And Samuel did, and, and Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. I'll give a little bit of backdrop into his story as well. Verse 8 And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for thou this called me. He's very adamant about the fact that you called me. And watch the text now. It says, And Eli perceived, Eli perceived that the Lord did call the child. So he did not get it the first time or the second time. There was something about the third time we which and whereby this young boy came to him. And maybe uh, I, I don't know if 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 it was the 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 tone in which he said it, or he spoke in this affirmative way. Yes, you did call me. You called me, and Eli, the Bible said, perceived that it was the Lord that called the child. Watch it now in 9. It says, therefore, Eli said unto him, go lie down, and it shall be, my God, if, my God, he called thee, thou shalt say, speak, Lord, for thy servant here. So Samuel went and lay down, and the Lord came and stood and called at 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 other times and uh, at other times excuse me Samuel Samuel then Samuel answered speak for thy servant hear it so for me that is all I hear the voice of the Lord the Lord may choose to express or reveal himself or communicate with you on a in in in, in a different way so I don't want you to think because God chooses to communicate with an individual that way. God has his reason why. 
because maybe if you hear the audible voice like I do, I don't know how you are going to respond to it. For me, the way I put it, when I begin to hear the Lord's voice, and that is before I even got saved, I used to say, and maybe this is what uh, the language that you use, this was the language I used before I got saved, something is telling me to do that. And what the something is telling me to do, it is an uncommon thing. It's different from what I would normally do as a person who was not saved. It was commanding and compelling me to do something that was godly and holy. But because of the life that I lived, that was not my normal recourse. So for me, naturally, I did not adhere to what was being asked of me because it felt unnatural and it felt uncommon. But it did not negate or change the fact that the conversation was happening, but I could not and I did not know that this was the voice, excuse me, of the word. Samuel and his story. A story is of such that his mother was barren, couldn't have a child. And because his mother was barren and could not have a child, she prayed to the Lord and she asked the Lord, give me a man child and I will dedicate that child back to you. God answered her prayer. She became pregnant and she dedicated Samuel back to the Lord. She said after he was weaned, she brought him to the temple and she gave him back to the Lord. So Eli was the priest at that time, teaching him about the ways of the Lord from a very, 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 very young child. The scripture says, train up a child in the way that he or she should grow. So when they're old, they will not depart from it. So Samuel was cocooned in an environment, learning and being taught of the things and the ways of the Lord. So when the moment was right, God chose to speak to him and it was an audible voice that he heard. Any questions so far? I'm taking my time tonight. Uh, I, I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So I do have a question. So mm -hmm. um, would you say that um, because normally whenever um, Samuel heard from, from God or, or got any message from God mm -hmm. before this point, mm -hmm. it came from Eli. Right, because and it, so because go, go ahead, ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. And because it, it, it he was used to it coming from Eli, mm -hmm. he associates the the voice of God with his leader. Correct. Would you say that it's it, it's important for a person to make sure that they're under godly leadership, so that when they do finally hear from God themselves? they have a leader that can point out what it is that they heard? Most definitely. And we're going to get into a little bit of that tonight. Because again, what we say and do, I was sharing with a friend of mine that the era in which I grew up in the church, right? Whatever, when I started in ministry, everything that I did in terms of preaching or being able to express or take the word and begin to share it was authenticated in front of the church. So we had evening service and evening service was dedicated for ministers that were up and coming or anyone who was gifted. We had the opportunity in evening service to stand and present our gifts to the church and the church leaders would validate, authenticate, and where there were any error in our understanding or our presentation of the gospel, they took the time based on context that was shared, and they walk with you through this. Son, you said this, but think about this. There is more to it than just this. You said this, but this is not in line with scripture. So whatever we say, we, 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 we need that environment where we can be nurtured and taught before we go on the big stage. So it's very important that we have mentors and 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 and, and preachers and teachers who listen to what we hear before we actually go out there. 
And it gets to my next point where we're going to read about the story with Gideon. Because Gideon is this young man, right? And living in the times in which he lived, the times in which he lived, the unfortunate thing is simply this. If your dad was a farmer, the expectation is that you should be a farmer. And so you just live according to cultural orientation and what your culture demands of you. Gideon is living this life. We're going to jump over to uh, Judges chapter number six. And he's living this life. And suddenly he hear this voice speaking to him. And the voice said to him, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon has never been called that. Gideon have never heard that in his life. But the Lord, understand this. Write this down if you're taking notes. When God speak to us. He speak to us out of our future. So Gideon is a farmer and God declared to him, you're a mighty man of valor. I'm trying not to jump and to get ahead of myself. I want to take my time and walk gently through this with us. So Gideon living as a farmer, God comes and he spoke to him and he interrupted his life and he said, you're a mighty man of valor. But I want to talk about this piece, because it's critical and it's important when we hear what we believe is the voice of God, this ought to be second nature to us as believers. We have to try and we have to test what we hear. Amen? We have to try and we have to test what we hear. So when we jump now over to Judges chapter number 6, we'll start at verse 25. In Judges 6 and 25, it reads thus, where are you, 25? Here we go. It says, and it came to pass on the same night that the Lord said unto him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years, and throw down the altar of Baal, my God, that thy father had, and cut down the grove by it. Build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of the rock and in order of the place, uh, in order of the place and take the second bullock and offer a sacrifice with wood of the grove and thou shalt cut it down. Then Gideon took 10 men, 10 men of his servant and did as the Lord said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, my God, but he did it by night. And when, they, and when the men of the city rose early in the morning before the altar of Baal, so it was a false god that they had set up and the Lord spoke to him and told him to tear it down, but I'm going somewhere with this, so just stay with me. And when, verse 28, and when the men of the city were as early in the morning before the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that it was, that it was by, and the second bullock was offered on the altar that was built, and they said one to another, who has done this thing? And, my God, when they inquired and asked, uh, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son that he may die, because he has cast down the altar of Baal, and because he has uh, cut down the grove that was by. Then Joash said unto all of them, and Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will he plead for Baal, or will he plead for him? He that will plead for him, let him put him to death while it is yet morning. If he be God, let him plead my God for himself because no one has cast on the altar. Therefore, on that day, he called on, they, they called him Jeroboam saying, let Baal plead against him because he has thrown down this altar. So God spoke to him and said, I need you to do this thing. He responded accordingly, and then the man decided that they wanted to kill him. Verse 34, but the spirit of the Lord was upon Gideon and blew the trumpet, and 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 Abizar gathered him. I'm trying to get to... Go. All right, there we go. Um, I, I'm trending right. Let's skip down to 36. And it says now, and Gideon said, no, let's go back to 34. The spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he said, blew the trumpet. And he sent messengers throughout Manasseh, who was also gathered after him. And he sent messengers to Asher and to um, Zebulon and to Naphtali and came and meet him. And Gideon said unto God, 
if thou will save Israel, if thou will save Israel by my hand, and let me read that again. Sorry, verse 36. And Gideon said unto the Lord, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, and thou hast said, Behold, I will put a piece of wool on the floor, and if do be on the fleece only, and it be dry all around the earth beside it, then I will know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand. Verse 38. Ah, by my hand, and thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow and, and thrust the fleece together and wring the dew out of the fleece a bowl full of water. And Gideon asked of the Lord, he heard the Lord speaking to him, calling him a mighty man of valor. Gideon wanted to make sure Gideon in his own way is having a conversation with the Lord because he needs confirmation. And Gideon said unto the Lord, let it, let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove that I may but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece and upon the ground. Let there be dew. And God did so. For it was dry upon the face only, and there was dew in all the ground. So what this is saying, the Lord spoke to Gideon, call him to do a mighty work. Gideon wanted to make sure, Gideon wanted confirmation. And so Gideon did not look to see what anybody else did uh, throughout history. Gideon said, God, I need confirmation to make sure that this is what you are asking me to do, and this is who you are. Gideon took a piece of fleece or cotton, and Gideon's conversation with the Lord is simply this. I want to make sure that this is you. I want to make sure, without a shadow of a doubt, I want to make sure that this is you. And Gideon said, I'm going to take the cotton or the fleece. And Gideon said, God, I know every morning I go to, every night rather, I go to bed and I go to sleep. When I get up in the morning, there is dew on the ground. I know that without a shadow of a doubt. And so for me to have clarity and context and confirmation, knowing that this is you, I am going to take the fleece or the cotton and I'm going to put it outside. And here is what I'm asking God. I am asking you to let the dew that fall from heaven, let the dew fall only on the fleece or the cotton and let the ground around it be dry. And I'm going to know that God, this is your voice speaking to me, commanding me to do this thing. Gideon went to sleep. And when Gideon got up and he looked outside, the very thing that he asked confirmation from of the Lord was the very same thing that he saw. The fleece was soaking wet. The Bible said he squeezed a bowl full of water out of, my God, the fleece or the cotton. And the ground around it was dry. Can you imagine in your own way asking God, is this you? You hear this voice speaking to you. You have no idea, but you want clarity and context and confirmation. And so you decide to engage the voice and you begin to have inner conversation with the voice. Lord, if this is you, I'm going to do this. And God, if you do that, then this is my confirmation. When it wasn't enough and God confirmed to Gideon that this is me. Gideon took the cotton and he went back to the Lord and he said, listen, I know my culture grew me a certain way just to make sure, and I want to make sure, I want to make sure like nobody's business. I'm going to take the cotton again, God. I'm going to put the cotton in the same scenario. And what I'm asking you for this time, is to let my God the dew fall around the ground and let the cotton be dry or the fleece. And if this happens, I know without a shadow of a doubt that this is you. God, 
at sundry times and diverse manner spoke. So Gideon heard, excuse me, the voice of the Lord commanded him to do a particular thing. And Gideon engaged the voice that he heard. And Gideon, in his own way, asked God. I'm not sure if you, <laughs> if you used to live this way where you do things and you said, God, if you are real, do this. And then I'm going to do that. Have you ever, uh, uh, am I the only one to have ever done that? I, I, I want to ask if you have ever had one of those moments and just to share what that was. No, you're not the only one. Definitely not the only one. I can't think of um, a, a situation, mm -hmm. but I know I tend to question mm -hmm. if this is God speaking to me. Mm -hmm. And I used to feel guilty when I questioned it, but then we had already talked about, you know, this passage. And so I don't feel guilty anymore because I want the clarity and the understanding that it is him speaking. Right, because the Lord, as you begin to read his word, right, and as you begin to hear it, it is going to stay with you. And so when you hear something that is being said, the Lord is going to bring that to your memory to say, yes, that is of me. You will hear it. And again, because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, it is the Holy Spirit inside of you that validate what you hear and say, yes, that is of God. So if you're thinking that I have to decipher all of this, no, God made it easy for you and for me. Excuse me, because the scripture says, when the spirit of truth has come, that is the Holy Spirit, he is going to lead you into all truth. So when we encounter something and we're trying to figure out or decipher, is this of God? It's an inner conversation that we start with the Holy Spirit. And in fact, if it's not of God, you're going to feel this, at least for me, it's this unsettling feeling that I feel and I begin to disengage whatever it is. Because God's Spirit is alive in you and in me. So God, at sundry times, and diverse manners spoke. So the point of reference to confirm, number one, in this day and age that we live, or in this dispensation, we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us. In the times of the Bible, prior to Jesus coming, God spoke through his prophets, and he spoke through men, and he spoke through women, and the Bible puts it this way, that the spirit of almighty God will come upon a man or a woman for a season. The Holy Spirit did not indwell and we did not carry the Holy Spirit like we do now. It was for a season. And when that person operated in or under the authority of my God, the Lord speaking through, we know because the thing that they spoke came to pass. So it's not a if, or it's not, uh, 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 I wonder if no, a person spoke and whatever it is that they spoke because they were the mode piece of God, that thing came to pass. And that is all we knew that this is of God. Any other question around that? I'm trying to get to the Genesis story because I mentioned to us that when God speak, he commands and I want to go to the Genesis story and read Genesis chapter number one. Before the world was fashioned and formed, God command things in place. And when he command them, my God, they came and whatever he declare over them, that is what they did. And that is what they do. When God creates anything, he does two things with his creation. Number one, he gives it a name. And number two, there's an assigned purpose that he has given to his creation. So when you look back in Genesis chapter number one, it says, God said, he command the son, he command commands my god the star he commands the earth he command he spoke any question before i get there? i'm taking my time tonight so when god speak 
me just get back to this over here. Four things he does with the audible voice of God. And just bear with me. This is things that I have here written in my phone. So when God speak audible, he commands us, he challenge us, he corrects us, and he comforts us. Amen. He commands, he challenge, he comforts, and he corrects us. And with just those two instances, I want to go to Genesis chapter number one and looking at God speaking and he's commanding. The word command, it comes from a Greek word, which means to appoint or to ordain. Amen. To appoint or to ordain, to charge, to give order, to lay charge, to give charge, to order. So when God speak and he command you to do something, we respond accordingly, or the expectation is that we respond accordingly. So when we look at Genesis chapter number one, and when we look at how many instances where the scripture says, and God says in three, let there be light, and there was light. So he command that light should be, and light was. When we get to verse six, it says, and God said, let there be a firmament, firmament in the midst of the water, and let it be divided, my God, from the water. And boom, he command, he spoke to it, and the order is he gives is like a military term. Think of you being in the military and your commander gives you instruction. You move and you follow the instruction. So God command in verse nine. And God says, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. Verse 11. And God says, let the earth bring forth grass and herbs and yield and seed and fruits and yield and fruits after its come. Verse 14, and God says, let there be light in the firmament. So God command and he gave the instruction and the thing that he gave uh, the instruction to, it came into existence. And God said in 17, and God said, uh, no, no, sorry. In, God, in 20, and God says, let the water bring forth abundant. Let, and God says, let the water bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that it may, f that, 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 that had life and the fowls that it may fly above the earth and open the firmament. And it was. And God says in 24, let the earth bring forth living creatures after its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth of all kinds. So God continues to command. If you think about a conductor conducting an orchestra and he stand there with the baton and he begins to point, that's what God did in creation. He command these things and they happen. So when God speaks to you in this tone or in this authoritative voice and he commands you to do something, we are expected to respond and to do it accordingly because that which he speak, we have confirmation because of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside that God is compelling or commanding me to do this thing. But the question for us is, Scripture says that ignorance still, it is no excuse. So when we hear something and we feel compelled to move towards it, we have the story of Gideon now where we ask for confirmation. It's perfectly fine to engage in a conversation with him because the voice you hear, you're hearing it for the first time. You don't quite understand who, what, when, how, where, and why. And so you're asking for clarity. Gideon asks for clarity in his own way because it's a relationship that you're building with him. You're building a relationship and the relationship, it's a dialogue in that you speak and he listens and he listens and then he speaks to you. So there is information, there is dialogue that's being communicated and we offer, we, 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 we come into this type of session where we need clarity and context in order to move. 
So if you have been taught that you don't question God, that is not scripture. Because we have to question God in order, number one, to know, is this, number one, you? Number two, is this the time for me to do and to move? Because God can speak a word to you, but it may not be the right time for you to engage the word. The word spoken to you, you may be in a difficult situation and the Lord may say to you, my sons and my daughter, it may look like this now, but it will not be like this all the time. And that's the assurance that you need in order to ah, disengage the distraction before you that wants to pull you here, there, and everywhere. But because he spoke to you and tell you that it's going to be all right, we disengage, we pause, and we don't worry about certain things because God already spoken to you and tell you that this too will pass. Questions? That is crazy that you, uh, that you brought that up because um, I was just having a conversation with my sisters this past weekend. And um, one of their questions to me was, why is it that people always say, don't question God? And my response to them was, I think that's more of, for people who don't have answers, they don't want you to ask God what answer is. Mm -hmm. um, but my thing is this, if he's the om omniscient, all-knowing one, Mm -hmm. Why would we not go to him to ask the questions? Exactly. Why wouldn't we go to him to, you know, to 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 confirm or to validate what it is that we're, you know, that we're pondering on? I feel like, I, I don't know. And I, I'm not sure where that comes from, you know? I think it may came at a time where people just did not or may not have an answer to hard questions that were being asked. And in order to pacify the situation, they just coined the term, don't question God. God is going to do what God is going to do. And in all instances, yes. But even if God does not answer me, I, 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 for me, this is a, a, a point in my life where I'm stuck and I've turned to man to get answer and man is 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 telling and saying stuff to me that still doesn't answer the question have you ever asked somebody a question and they're beating around the bush and never really give you an answer and you know they don't know and as opposed to saying i don't know they try to pull something and make something up that they think is going to appease you in that moment yep reason through what is said and you're saying but this still doesn't make any sense because of this this and that we have to we have to question god and maybe this is where the disconnect is for the church because again i brought us back into scripture right when moses went up into the presence of the lord and moses spent so much time in the presence of the Lord that when he came down, the scripture says that Moses' very countenance changed. And when he stood before the people, they said to him, because they, they, they became very afraid because his face radiated, the scripture says. They said to Moses, my God, we're afraid. We do not want to go into the presence of the Lord. You go, and whatever he says to you, we will do. Maybe the church has never recovered from that. In that the people are saying, I don't want to go. Whatever you say, I am going to, or we will do. Relieving ourselves of the responsibility of having an authentic relationship with God. Because the priests go and speak to God and you get it. It's secondhand information. It's diluted somewhat. And it's not to say that every person who stand to represent Christ is going to dilute what you get. Because we know in the times in which we live, yes, individual says that God says. And when that which they declare does not become a reality. They begin to add stuff and make stuff up. No, the time has come for God's people to go in his presence. And we go boldly. The scripture commends us to come boldly. So why are 
you depending on me to go on your behalf when you can go. We have that right. And this is something that I'm trying to help us to understand. As believers, we have the right to have conversation with God on our own behalf. If we have questions and things are said and we don't quite understand it, then yes, the preacher comes in and again points you back to scripture so you can have clarity and context about what God is asking of you. Anyone who comes to me and says, Pastor, do you think this is right or wrong? I said, let me say this to you. That's not my role, and you're not going to get me to usurp the role of the Holy Spirit, because the scripture says when the spirit of truth is come, he is going to lead you into all truth, not me. That's not my role, and that's not my responsibility. So I cannot answer that question for you. But what I can do is to join you in prayer about this matter that is on your heart. And let us go boldly before the throne of God to inquire about the thing. Because if God had sundry times and diverse manners spoke, he wants to talk to you about what is on the table of your heart. But if you never get into his presence, if you never get into his word, if you never spend time with him, you are going to walk around and that thing will get pushed off to the side. And if you think about the story, the show hoarders, can you imagine how many unanswered questions the believers are walking around with because we fail to engage the Lord? We have to. Gone are the days where they tell you that you don't do this or you can't. It is not scriptural. It's not. God extend invitation for us to come. To come into dialogue. Come, sit down, let us reason, the scripture says. That's what the scripture says. So if the invitation is extended for me and you to come and to sit and the reason with him, why are we regressing and falling backwards and ah, we this and we that? No. That was what they may have taught, but this is no. Because you have a responsibility for God to confirm his word in your life and in your heart. So we read the Gideon story. Gideon went before God. God, it's just me. But here is what I'm asking you. If this is you and you want me to do this, I'm going to ask you to do something also. And give him an opportunity to prove that, yes, it is him. And when you get confirmation to what you ask, whether it's through verbal, whether it's through inner conversation, whether it's the Holy Spirit, however way you communicate with him in that moment, that's one of your point of reference. So he may use that avenue to continue to initiate conversation with you because you are comfortable with that way in which he communicates. And as you begin to read, as you begin to spend time in prayer, and as you begin to digest his word, you will begin to hear his word. Kenya, when you were growing up, or Allison, Tiny, you don't know anything about pen pal. Did, did any one of you had uh, pen pals? No, I didn't have a pen pal, but I do know what it is. What it is. How about no, you? I didn't Allison? have any. Did so, Kaimi, we, we, we're going to explain to you what it was like. So this was <laughs> this was our internet. There used to be, I think it was a book. I can't remember how we would get the information of the pen pal, but you would have, it's. I think it was in a book, right? And you would it have- It was the little, um, uh, it was like it had the little cartoons and a little activities. I can't remember what it was called. And you would have persons' information that are there, living in different parts of the world. And you would just pick a person and say, that's my pen pal. And what you literally do 
you would write letters to each other, put it in the mail, mail it off, that person will get it, the person would respond. Think about this, if you will. Tommy, you and I are pen pals, and we have been communicating for years. The opportunity presented itself where I am moving here to North Carolina. Still talking about, can you hear me now? So in my letters that I write to you, I express myself, what I like to do. And, you know, I say to you that fishing is something that I like. And, you know, when I come, you know, I would love to go fishing. It so happened that the doors open up and I come here to North Carolina and we meet. And because I've said to you all along, you know, fishing is something that I like. You went ahead and you charter a boat and you say, you know, we have this fishing out and that we have to go. And think about what it would be like timing if I get here and you said, you know, Ian, the boat is ready. We're going fishing. And I say to you, what are you talking about? I hate fishing. I don't like fishing. I get seasick. What would your response be if that was my response to you? Knowing that I spent all this time and we are in communication, what would your response be? My response is going to be, well, you said that this is something that you enjoy doing. And so what I would do is go back and reference the letters that you sent saying what it is that you like. Now, I don't want to jump ahead of you, but I feel like where you're going <laughs> no, go ahead. is I feel like for us as believers, that's the same thing that, we, that we're responsible for doing is going back to what it is that's written and referencing what it is that he said. Uh, I, I believe it's First John. I could be wrong, but I think it's First John four, mm -hmm. where it says, "Believe not every spirit, but try the spirit to see if, spirit. if it be of God." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we as believers are responsible for doing. This is not a oh God, and, and this 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 is dear to me because um, I spent so much time um, being afraid of as you said earlier, questioning God. So this this is dear to me. Um, I feel like us as believers, it's, it's a part of our responsibility to reference and to ask questions and to go back and, and, and reference what it is that God said, especially in his word. And when it comes to hearing from God, when it comes from, you know, comes to being prophesied to and all the other stuff, it should always be able to go back and be referenced in what's already written. Agreed. And this is one of the reason, you know, as a preacher, I would say this to not only our church, but wherever I go. If I stand to preach and in the moment I get word of wisdom or the Lord begin to speak to me, to you, and I begin to relay the information as I hear it in my spirit. You have a right to take that word and to bring it back to him and say, God, you said, how many of us <laughs> have ever <laughs> confronted somebody and said, you said, it's a right that you have. God, you said through the preacher, A, B, and C. I just need confirmation, God. I need confirmation. And you pray about what is being said. Don't just get ready to disrupt your life and set it in motion because it is a word for you. But the question or the clarity and context you need is, is it a now word? Is it a now word? Is it something that I need to do now? Because for a lot of us, we are in sessions or we're in churches or church services and we get a word and we feel that, my God, tomorrow we're going to disrupt our old life and we're going to tear everything down because God said, yes, he said it. 
But the question is, is it a now word or is it a next word? David comes to mind when David was anointed to be king over Israel. He was anointed to be king and there is nothing that could change that because the anointing oil could not pour until he gets there. But it took David 27 years before he sat on the throne of Israel. So even though God anointed him to be king over Israel, it wasn't an immediate thing because David was immature and there are some things that God wanted to fix in him. So that's why I said to us, when God speak and command certain things of us, God speak to us out of our future. So he declared to you, Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. Read the story of Gideon because God now uses Gideon to accomplish great things. When he started out with Gideon, he started out with 30,000 men. And you see, this is where it kind of get uh, uh, conflicted for us. And we begin to even look at God differently because Gideon started out with 30,000 men to go fight this battle. And God said to him, hey, they're too much. But again, it's the same voice that spoke to you and confirmed to you that, yes, this is me that is telling you to go do this thing. So now the same voice is saying to you, there's this battle that has to be fought. But the problem with the church or is, is that we look at the reputation of others or things that are out there and we fail to look at the reputation of God because he asks us the question, is there anything too hard for me? God says they're too much. He says, take them down to the book and tell them to drink. And the Bible said that the ones who lap my God like a dog, First, there was a first there, he trimmed it somewhat, and then he took them again to 3,000, and he took them down to the brook and said, whoever put their face in, my God, the brook, and lap like a dog, those are the ones that you are going to use to fight this battle. 300. So if God spoke to you to confirm his word, and now he is teaching you, he is have you on this journey of teaching and learning and better understanding who he is. And he tells you that 30,000 men is too much. And when it withered down to 300, can you hear me now, Gideon? Because our question now is, God, how are we going to use 300 men to fight this battle? And God is saying, the battle is not yours. It is mine. Stand still and look at what I'm going to do. And what we have to do is to quit looking at, my God, the things that are beyond our comprehension. And we just have to align with him because he's going to strategically place the 300 men to win this battle. And that's what he did. Can you hear me now? I spoke to you and I confirmed my word to you that I need you to do this thing. And when you brought the men before me, I spoke to you again and said they're too much. Conventional wisdom say to you, Gideon, ah, this kind, what, what, what do you mean? I know they have 40,000 men over there, but God is saying they're too much. Why? Because they're not committed. God has to get rid of those who are not committed. And so he's going to use men who are committed and united in order to accomplish his end goal. Any other questions? Before we close. iPhone 4, any question? No? All right. So again, in closing, God, speak to us through our five senses. And in this day and dispensation that we live in, God's Holy Spirit lives on the inside. So there are some things that you're going to touch and God's spirit is going to say, do not touch that. There are some things that you are going to see. God's spirit is going to say, close your eyes to that. There are things that you're going to smell. There are things that you're going to taste. And there are things that you're going to hear 
and God's spirit is going to say to you, mm -mm, you shouldn't be doing that. And then we experience godly conviction. So when we feel that uneasiness in here, that's God's way of speaking to you non-verbally and saying, yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. So God in sundry time and diverse manner spoke. We're looking at God speaking audibly. So tonight we touched on God commanding in the Genesis story in that he command. It's, 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 it's the authority with which he speak like a military command given instruction. And when he does, we are going to, my God, respond accordingly. We're going to look from the end of our conversation, uh, time when other voices begin to speak and we have to authenticate those voices. So we're going to look at the counterfeit that speaks. Still going to look at God correcting, still going to look at him commended, and we're still going to look at um, him confronting us. Because God has to confront us in the error of our ways for us to grow and to learn. We are going to pray. Father, we come before you tonight. My God, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence. My God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that's alive and well in us. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, just for offering clarity and context to us, my God, so that we know it's okay to question, it's okay to ask, it's okay to inquire of you, because that's what they did in the olden days. They inquired, they asked questions, so my God, they could know, yes, this is the time, yes, this is what you want me to do. So I pray tonight, God, that you will expunge that idea and thought from our mind that we do not question you. We do not engage you to get clarity and context. You don't want us to walk around in ignorance. You want us, my God, to engage you and to dialogue and to converse with you. And by you doing so, God, you, my God, will get the glory out of our life. Spirit of the living God, we come before you tonight and we're asking you, God, teach us, help us to get to that place where the scripture said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. So if I have your word in my heart, your word has a seat at the table of my heart. And when I begin to deliberate over matters that are heavy and hard, your Holy Spirit will speak to me and say, yea or nay or wait. We look to you tonight and we say thank you in Jesus' name. We pray God bless you and thank you.